All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings here from uh, Gator Studio in New Jersey. See that chat box is already pretty active. A lot of you uh, logging in. A lot of excitement in there, Mike. They're excited. They are. We got a great show for them and a special treat. AJ here is uh, certainly one of our most knowledgeable reps, and uh, he's definitely the funniest. Well, that's not saying much, Mike, but I appreciate that. Uh, so, yeah, it's great to be here at Gator Studio. We want to thank our paver manufacturer partners, our dealers, our contractors. You guys could have been anywhere, and you chose to be here with us in Gator Studio, and we really appreciate that here. So, you know, Hopefully that's the right choice for the day, right? We'll see. We'll see. Only time will tell, right? All right. So talking about polymeric sand and it being easy, AJ, I think it is. Yeah. Well, but... you're, you're a smart guy, Mike. I, I'm not as smart as Mike, so I've struggled with some uh, poly sand mistakes over the years. Uh, as I've grown and spread my wings here, I've encountered some, uh, some through, through contractors that have brought me out and shown me certain things that they're struggling with, and some of my own, to be honest with you, getting started. But you've been here a long time, so if you go out and install polymeric sand tomorrow, you're not going to make any mistakes, right? I'm a veteran. At this point, I've learned my lesson, I've made my mistakes, I've learned from them, and we want to help you do the same. Right. So, We're going to walk you through some of these common mistakes. Well, learn from AJ's experience, right? Don't make the same mistakes he did. Have successful polymeric sand installs because it's no fun fixing a failed polymeric sand install, is it? It's not fun fixing. It's, um, it's expensive to fix, and it's, it's counterintuitive to what we're doing. You guys, your contractors out there, you guys want to make money, so you're not going to do that if you're going back on the job and fixing your polymeric sand mistakes. Right. You know, very, very simple installation process. Let's follow those steps. Make sure that we're installing the sand properly as it's supposed to be installed. You're going to get a long-lasting, durable you know, finishing touch to your hardscape project. 15-year warranty, Mike. So in order to achieve that 15-year warranty in some of the climates that we sell polymeric sand in, we have to really stack the odds in our favor. And there's a lot of things. We're going to go over a couple very simple things that you can do to stack those odds in your favor and increase your likelihood of having that type of lifespan on your poly sand. Well, the first thing that you can do to stack those odds in your favor is to choose the right sand. You know, we sell quite a few different bagged polymeric sand products and now a resin-based sand called Gator Nitro, and they all have a specific use case. There's unfortunately no one-size-fits-all project uh, product, is there, AJ? Not really. Do you, what do you do? You just pick your favorite color, Mike, and go with whichever bag you like the color? Or yeah, do you... that, that yellow bag's pretty nice, right? Nice-looking yellow. Just Shiny, nice yellow. Yeah, puts you in a good mood. But the reality is, yeah, you to stack the odds in our favor, step one is choosing the right product for the right project. So there's uh, a variety of products that were just up on the screen there, and we could go in depth, and you can call your alliance rep to come out and go in depth with each of these products. But there are, to Mike's point, there are some products that are uh, close to being a catch-all, one, one in particular. Right, that Gator Max G2, that orange bag, well, that's the closest thing we have to a universal product. And we'll kind of touch on some of the reasons why, but it's our most durable, most water-resistant, easiest to install polymeric sand. And that water resistance is key, right? Polymeric sands are not mortar, they're not concrete. When they get wet, they activate those polymers. As they dry out, they harden up. You know, how long does it take polymeric sand to fully cure, AJ? So the part of the curing is that it has to dry out, right? Well, how long does that take? So, That's what I want to know. Yeah, that you put me on the spot here, Mike, and I can appreciate that, but I'm going to dance a little bit here, okay? So in order to fully cure for polymeric sand, it has to dry out. That's going to be contingent on your, your site conditions, right? So uh, definitely. I mean, the that's a dance. side of a house, yep. shady areas are yep. going to dry slower, and your base and setting bed material choices may determine how well that joint dries out. So your drainage, your temperatures, uh, the amount of water used on the installation, how well everything, that, that all of that's going to play a role. So there's really, as much as I'd like to have a simple answer for you, Mike, I don't got one. Right. So that polymeric sand might dry out in six hours in the desert, but it might take six days in a wetter you know, environment. Polymeric sands need to dry in order to fully harden, and every time they get wet, they soften up slightly, they expand a little bit. So we need to take into account our site conditions. And one of the biggest issues that we see is that base or setting bed material. If you take a look at this video, what do we see here, AJ? Okay, so you got three things going on all at once here. They're gonna start in the top left-hand corner, and that's stone dust. And that's something that uh, in my market, I still come across cross fairly often. I think every market sees quite a bit of stone dust. That makes me feel a little bit better about my life, Mike. Well, so, yeah. unfortunately, it's a terrible product to use underneath your pavers. It traps and holds moisture. You can see the water backing up along the edge of the paver there. That's almost like a, what, a half inch high already. Right. And so if your water is backing up and you're applying a ton of water to install or you get a big rain event, right, um, you're putting water there. 
not only is your polymeric sand going to stay wet, which uh, we as poly sand guys know that's no good, your pavers are going to stay wet. That could cause problems, right? Right. You can see that concrete sand up in the top right is draining much more freely, right? Sure. The water backs up a little bit, but it's soaking through and permeating through. And obviously that chip stone in the bottom, kind of that hybrid base idea, well, that's free draining, right? The water moves right through it. So, all right. Different options, different options for your, your bedding layer. We already talked about choosing the right polymeric sand. Well, let's take those one at a time, AJ. Yep, yep. You know, say you're installing over stone dust. You insist on installing on stone dust. We could talk till we're blue in our face and it's not going to change your mind. Right, I've been there. So if, if we're in that situation, we're going back to that orange bag that Mike had put up here. That orange bag is the G2 Gator Max. That's going to, again, I hate to keep repeating myself, stack the odds in your favor. Right, Mike? Right. So that, Regular polymeric sands, they soften up a fair amount when they get wet, right? All those polymers, they get kind of well, soft and gummy. That's fine, right? Polymeric sand can cycle a million times, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. But it can be a problem if that polymeric sand always stays wet. And in a stone dust uh, setting bed environment, odds are that joint's always staying wet. So the Gator Max is a more durable, water-resistant blend of polymers. They don't soften up quite as much. so. While we still don't recommend installing over stone duster screenings, it's going to give you the best chance for success. Now, how about that sand setting bed, right? Concrete sand? Uh, a much more uh, industry accepted uh, bedding layer. It, it's something that we say at Alliance, uh, you can install over a concrete bedding sand because you saw in that, that image, it does drain. So it gives that water somewhere to go. You can, again, if I'm, if I'm installing for the, the small amount of price difference from that Gator Max, for my money, I'm still really reaching for that orange bag, that G2 Gator Max on a concrete bedding, uh, I'm sorry, on a concrete sand bedding layer, but you certainly could also use the, the G2 Super Sand. Yep, certainly could. You know, both equally applicable. That joint can dry out from the top and the bottom quite well. Now, how about that chip stone, right? So that chip stone is a very, um, a, a very hot topic in the industry right now. Uh, a lot of discussions being had, a lot of companies talking about the benefits of a permeable or a hybrid permeable install from your base to your bedding layer. But that chipstone, as you saw in that video, drains very well. And uh, if you have a system that is built to accept the water, a really good idea for that is nitro. Yeah, right? plus, you know, strength top to bottom, chokes off immediately. You don't have that sand migrating down into the void space of the chip. So nitro is a great option for those hybrid base installs. So it really is key to choose the right sand for the right project. Um, you know, that covers, I'd say, almost every type of concrete paver installation there. At There's least some... the, the main ones, right? There's some extra, yeah, but agreed. And those are, utilize your, your dealers, utilize our our paver reps and our partners utilize your sand salesmen uh, and your guys and gals at Alliance because ultimately we have those answers. If you have a unique situation, we may have a unique product or we may direct you to that same orange bag. That so how about a couple of those unique situations? Can you give the guys a quick run through? Uh, we'll throw that image of all the bags back up and you can walk them through, uh, I say gator dust. Yep. So gator dust is one that of my red favorite. Bag there. You see it uh, third one over in the top, the top uh, row. Gator dust is one of my favorite products. For your flagstone, for your large uh, natural stone projects where you might have a three or a four inch joint, there's a bigger aggregate in that gator dust. So it looks a lot more natural in that installation. And it's tough to see on that picture, but uh, the gator dust is great for flagstone. The Euro stone that was up there is great for cobblestone pavers, right? So there are, uh, and then like we talked about, if you have a permeable or a hybrid base, we're gonna reach for the nitro. So again, not one shoe that fits all. We wish it was that simple, but utilize us. All right, thanks, AJ. Yep. So really the first key is choosing the right product. And then, hey, from there, you need to install that right product correctly. That's, uh, it seems simple, simple advice, but it's a challenge. We Fairly see big deal. misinformation, you know, misinstallations all over the time. You just have to follow a couple very easy steps. So with polymeric sand, we sweep the sand across the surface, right, AJ? Yep, yep. So you're pushing that broom and you're, you're sweeping that sand across the surface. Now, say I have a really wide joint in my paver. It's like an inch wide. The polymeric sand falls right into that joint. So why do I need to compact? The joint's already filled up. Right. So the, the misconception there is that I have to compact to really work that sand into the joint. But what we're ultimately doing is the vibration through the compactor or a roller compactor or a mallet, if need be, it is vibrating the pavers and allowing that sand to consolidate down to the bottom. And we've actually done some homework on that, Mike, and we can talk about how much sand and how much void space 
Yeah, how much sand you're lacking and how much void space you're creating by not compacting. Well, we've got a little demonstration right here. So this column of sand is about five inches wide, right? I'll That's, take your word for it. It's a wide, yeah, wide yeah. paper joint. All right, so we've got Kirk here standing by. He's going to turn on the vibrating table underneath this column, and you're going to watch that sand drop quite a bit. Fire us so, up, Kirk. Let's see what happens. All right, Kirk, thank you. So we just watched that sand column drop quite a bit. If we didn't do that, we're missing quite a bit of the polymeric sand that should be in that joint. Absolutely, and that's where uh, if we're looking for maximum performance from these products and you've spent all this money on this hardscape project and you're going to uh, go sh shorten the, the process by sweeping it in and not compacting, you're really doing yourself a disservice because there you can see that on that infographic the, the sand drops considerably. You can see it in the demo. Without that, what's there is void uh, airspace. All right, well, let's, let's switch to uh, our little iPad uh, sketch pad here. All right. And I'm going to show you just kind of what that looks like. So we draw our little paver here. That's a nice Terri looking, terrible nice artist, looking paver. But, yeah, look at that. Right, so we got our paver joint here, and we're going to put our polymeric sand particles in the paver joint here. So we fill it up, and Crosso. if we don't compact, well, those particles are pretty far apart, right? So there's air gaps in between, there's void space, there's a lot of empty space in there that can fill up with water, right? Can absorb a lot more water. Those bonds, the particles are further apart, right? Sure. So those bonds aren't as strong. If you install base material, do you leave it loose and fluffy? Not if you're doing it right. Right, you need to compact your base material. You also need to compact your polymeric sand. So if we're going to compact our polymeric sand, that means that the particles are going to get much closer together. They're going to get much more densely packed. So let's take a look at, oh, let me get it to the next, go back one, there we go. All right, so if we do that same paver here, and we put our particles nice and close together, well, what do you see, AJ? First of all, we got more of them in there, don't we? Right, and just as a general building principle, you have more in there, but everything's nice and compact in there. I would assume that that's going to perform a lot better, and you can expect a lot better strength and uh, integrity in that product than you have in your much more spread out polymer. Right, you've got more bonds, more contact between the particles transferring the load, more points of adhesion with the polymers gluing those together, less void space for water to infiltrate. So. Properly compacted polymeric sand is going to be 30 to 50 percent stronger and 30 to 50 percent more water resistant. That sounds a, like an important key point to me. That's a considerable number, and you seem to know an awful lot about poly sand, Mike. I'll be honest with you. So that that's a 30 to 50 percent is a uh, should be a staggering number to you if you're thinking about what we're what we're asking from the polymeric sand and how we're asking it to perform and um, what, what you're getting with a, by compacting it into those joints. All right, I think we have a question, so let's All take right. that. Eric, can you read that question out for us? Yes, yeah, so we actually have a couple questions. Uh, the first question was, what best, what's the sand you recommend for clay pavers? All right, what do you recommend for clay pavers, AJ? Clay pavers are a challenge, right? Some are super dense, like a concrete paver, and some are super porous. Right, so again, uh, the cl clay pavers is almost, you could do a class on clay pavers itself. It's a unique thing. Me, personally, I'm reaching for that same orange bag we were talking about. Right, that Gator Max, right? G2 Gator Max, in particular, right. you know? So Gator Max, more water resistant, yep. does well with those clay pavers that might absorb a lot of water. And that G2 technology means it's cleaner. So it's less likely to leave a residue on those clay pavers that might have a lot of void space, right. um, you know, holes in the surface, or a high moisture content. What else do we have, Eric? Uh, the next question was, can you, can you use a stabilizer, and they specify uh, decomposed granite stabilizer, on polymeric sand? A specified decomposed granite stabilizer on polymeric sand as uh, I mean, I'm guessing as like a pathway all by itself I wouldn't recommend that you know the decomposed granite has different sized particles in it you range from that kind of uh, quarter inch or three eighths inch particle down to fine material and that kind of locks itself in together with the binder and forms a solid surface I wouldn't really recommend using a binder with polymeric sand as a pathway if you're looking to put a sealer on top of a polymeric sand. Well, that's completely fine, isn't it, AJ? Absolutely. So at first, what you're talking about, what Eric's asking about, uh, as a sales guy, I get excited because I'm going to sell a lot of poly sand, right? 
Uh, but generally speaking, that's not really the way the product's intended to be used. But to Mike's point, a joint stabilizing sealer on polymeric sand only works to enhance really some of the benefits of polymeric sand. Right, it's going to decrease the water penetration and absorption, strengthen the surface, but you want to activate your polymeric sand with water, let it dry, and then come back and install your sealer. Not a necessary thing, but certainly a thing that can be done. All right, anything else, Eric? What else you got? Yeah, there's uh, one more um, about porcelain. What, what do you recommend for porcelain? Well, porcelain's a trick question. <laughs> yeah, Mike's favorite question, actually. You've got actually. large slabs that are completely non-porous, no spacer bars. So porcelain is a very big challenge for a joining material because it's not stable. If you step on one side of a porcelain tile, the other side lifts up. They shift, they twist, they rock. So porcelain tile need to be stable in order to put a, a material in those joints. Now, I personally think there are only two ways to successfully install outdoor porcelain tile. One is to thin set it to a concrete slab and use grout, and the other way is our gator tile system. So seven components, they all work together to provide the foundation, the alignment, and the stability for that tile, and we'd put gator nitro in the joints, our air-cured resin-based joining material. That sounds like a perfect segue into another presentation. We can keep them here all day, Mike. Yeah, I don't think we have time for that. All right, so we'll... we'll Breeze over that, but yeah, absolutely reach out to your, uh, your local rep and get information because we do have a system that's very, very good for porcelain tile. And we've seen many challenges, just like we're walking you through challenges with polymeric sand and hoping you learn from some uh, mistakes that we've seen in the past. Same thing goes with tile, right? It's tough to install, can be done correctly, but we've seen uh, quite a few of those issues that commonly pop up. All right, so I don't want to get Mike upset and keep talking about tile. So let's get back to polysand. We, we talked about first the importance of choosing the right product, right? And then we talked about the importance of your bedding layer and that there's drainage built into your system. Then we talked about how important compaction is and we gave you numbers and we showed you a demo. Uh, the next part of that conversation, Mike, really is the height of the joint, am I right? Yes, the height of the joint is very critical. We want that polymeric sand to be an eighth of an inch below the chamfer or the edge of the stone there. So making sure that that's certainly low enough, that it's not going to expand above the surface, it's not going to come above the actual edge of the paver or the stone. Polymeric sand should always stay in the vertical portion of that paver, AJ. So that's a very impactful graphic that you see there because that, uh, that does a couple things, and Mike and I have discussed this at length, a, that allows for the, the shape of the paver to be present and enhances the way that the paver is intended to look. If your sand is flush with that, uh, the top of the paver, right, what do you get? You get one, one surface, essentially, that looks like uh, one flat floor, right? Well, pavers are supposed to be three-dimensional, right? Correct. They're supposed to look like stones. Yep. So you might as well have poured concrete if you're going to fill the joints up all the way. Not to mention the problems that we're going to have with uh, performance here. Any type of abrasion from foot traffic to dragon furniture to whatever you're dragging across this, basic principles uh, is, is that the abrasion is going to cause this to degrade, where this is protected simply by being an eighth of an inch below the chamfer, and it looks nicer. That's the way it's intended to look. I agree. Yep. I agree. And that joint height is kind of uh, exacerbated by a common tendency with polymeric sands, right? When they get wet, they swell up a little bit. So take a look at this video. It's kind of an overly dramatic view of polymeric sand swelling in the joints. But you can see it was flush with the surface when we started. And as it absorbs that water, it expands above the surface where it's even more prone to some of that damage that AJ was talking about from foot traffic, from car tires, even a hose or, or bike driving across the surface. That's the big one for me is even on day of installation, we're not even talking a couple weeks down the road. We're talking if you left that flush with the surface of the paver and that under the condition of water has now expanded and you're dragging the hose across that to get to the next area to water, you could cause a problem right then and there. You know. Plus, if you're having that polymeric sand up in the chamfer or that rounded edge of the paver, well, as that sand expands, it's almost ripping itself away from the pavers, away from the sides, and that's going to fail, right? Yeah, so I guess it, it seems like a simple uh, concept, but we as polysand guys are going to stress it and, and really drive the point home. But Mike, what do you do, I guess, 
to other than be mindful of what we're doing here and we don't want it to look like this, we do want it to look like this, what do you do to achieve that eighth of an inch reveal? What, is there anything you can do to There's kinda... a couple different things. First, the compaction is important, right? Sure. If that sand is densely packed into the joints, it's easier to set the proper joint height because it's kind of wedged into that vertical portion of the paver. So once we have it properly compacted, we're going to clean that sand off the surface until we get to the right joint height. Now, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can do it with a fine bristle broom, right? Yep. It allows you to get down in there, but hey, uh, 1,000 square feet, I'm not setting the joint height with a, a lot of fine bristle broom. Yeah. I'm going to use a leaf blower, right? Leaf blower at a pretty high uh, speed there. Key tip is always keep the tube of your leaf blower moving. If it sits in one spot, it's going to blow out too much sand. But if it's always moving around the surface, you're going to be able to set that joint height nice and perfectly. And it's something that after having this conversation, after looking at that graphic, after talking to your rep and seeing this type of demo, um, it's something that you can be mindful of and you know what it should look like and what it shouldn't look like. What if, and because I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this because I've heard it multiple times, what if the homeowner's suggestion is it needs to be, there needs to be more sand in there? Mike, what are you telling the well, homeowner? What if the homeowner tells the contractor that they like their roofing shingles upside down rather than right side up? Yeah, I, luckily I don't, I don't belong up on a roof, so I wouldn't have anything to do with that. But that roofing contractor is not going to install the shingles upside down because they know the job won't work, right? Absolutely. The point being, educate them. Use the, use the tools that we have to educate you guys and uh, expand that. And, and you're, the you're the contractor, you're the professional. Tell them why we're doing this, the same reason we're telling you, you know. Well, one last reason why we do it is actually the watering process, right, AJ? Exactly. So, again, we're, uh, these things tend to chain link into the next thing, you know. <laughs> if but, your joint's filled all the way up to the top, right, and we start watering it, where's that water go? It's going to shed off. It's going to be right running off everywhere. The surface, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yep. If we've got this nice chamfer that almost channels the water into the joint, well, that seems perfect. You get a little bit of water to sit in there and drain into the joint and activate a sufficient depth. Yeah, and in due time, I would assume if we're pounding that with water, because with our polymeric sands, uh, it's a much more common practice to see somebody has underwatered a joint and had an issue with it than has overwatered the joint. Am I right, Mike? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd say if there's ten jobs out there. You know, five of them are watered correctly, yeah, and probably the other five are underwatered. Underwatered, right? So this is kind of uh, making it easier because when you put water on there and it's sitting there in that channel, the physics of it is it's going to continue to drain, and in theory or in reality, it's going to give you much thicker crust in, in that joint. Right. So if you take a look at our kind of close up here of this paver, that's a line showing the proper joint height. Now. You've been telling me an eighth of an inch below the top of the paver or the chamfer, but that looks like it's a quarter inch. Right, and that's a, uh, a, a perfect example because it's supposed to be an eighth of an inch below the lowest part, right? All right, so I guess if I was an eighth of an inch below that highest point, I'd actually be coming over the top of the lowest point. A hundred percent, and you're going to have that issue that we saw in that video with expansion. You're going to have this issue that we're talking about here where the joint's too high, abrasion, and so stack, stack the odds in your favor uh, cheat it that that quarter of an inch or whatever. We should have titled this Stack the Stack Odds the, in I Your think Favor. I think next year I that's think, what we're right? going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tune in next year for Stack the Odds in Your Favor. But really, if you had a paver that had a very wide joint, maybe a cobblestone looking paver, I could see that joint being three eighths of an inch below the top. It, and it will be, or it should be. And again, it can be achieved with the blower, it can be achieved with the, the broom, but it needs to be because you're going to pound that with water. You've got a considerable joint on there, and it looks Incre remarkably better when it's it's given that paver the opportunity to take the shape that it has naturally. All right. Well, I think we hammered on joint height enough, Beat right? Beat that to death. To move yeah, on? let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. So we've talked compaction. We've talked joint height. Let's talk watering, Mike. That essentially what feels like the last step to this process. Well, it really is. So watering is a key step to installing polymeric sand. Proper activation of that polymeric sand is going to ensure that the product has a nice, thick, durable crust and performs and lasts as long as it should. If you don't water it enough, well, you can be left with a paper-thin crust, very prone to damage and destruction and shortened lifespan there. So why are we talking about a crust, AJ? Polymeric sands, they don't harden all the way through top to bottom? No, they're not going to. And so that's where when we talk about some other products, we talk about our nitro sand, that's one of the advantages. Um, and, and again, it's going to depend on the project. The right product for the right project is the other thing that we really want to drive home. But you're not going to get a, a totally set up joint with polymeric sand. What we're shooting for, uh, A, 
is if we have it in the below the chamfer so that the water can channel in there and we're applying enough water which is key you're going to get a nice inch inch and a half thick crust yep i'd say that hey an inch and a half or so if you can get that is certainly ideal but anywhere from a half inch to an inch and a half is typical normal polymeric sand behavior right we want that polymeric sand to form a nice thick durable crust glue itself to the sides of the paver it's got some flexibility, right? Yep. It can move with interlocking concrete pavers. And that thick crust is supported by the densely packed material underneath, that material that we packed in well during our compaction step, right? Right, right. Um, but oftentimes, that's not what we actually get on a job site, AJ. We get a thin crust. Absolutely. And uh, there's a couple reasons that, that can happen. You see right here, you can imagine just uh, even if you knew nothing about polysand, how long is this going to last? How is this going to perform? And, you know, that's even thicker than some of the crust. That For I sure. I, when sites, I touched right? it, I just realized that's thicker than I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the problem in, in my experience a lot of time is that underwatering, right? Or that joint being too high. And so the, it's not accepting. Well, that's both. That's underwatering both. still. Exactly. The joint's same, same thing. But if you're not getting that water there, and we talk about the uh, rapid set component of the G2, right? And so if I'm hitting that with a, a, a mist of water or not enough water, and this is rapid set, uh, quick action curing from the, the G2, by the time I come back maybe to hit it again because I don't know if I got it enough, it's already rejecting a lot of that water, and my crust has been set, and it's thin. Well, that's an important point, AJ, because the instructions on polymeric sand have changed over time, right? A sure long have. time ago yeah. when they first launched, it was missed it once lightly and walk away. Then it was kind of a three-step watering process, yep. right? Yep. One, two, three successive heavier waterings. But if you do that three-step watering process or mist on the G2 or, you know, um, whether it's Super Sand or Max with rapid set technology, you're going to have a problem. You're going to form a thin crust that isn't durable isn't going to last as long as it should. Um, we got a little video here, AJ showing you kind of the comparative durability of a thick versus a thin crust. So AJ trained up, you know, he's got some uh, martial arts skills here. Sure do. And he's got a thin crust that he's going to try to break. So do we think AJ can break that thin crust? Snap. There it goes. Look at that. Wasn't even a challenge, A lot of right? force there, a lot of force there. Now in that a thick foot. crust. A thicker crust. Oh, All right. Yeah. He's going to hurt his foot there. Dur I did, yeah. Yep. Look how sad I look. Yeah. Oh. Uh -huh. All right. So AJ tried his best to break that thick, durable crust and failed. We need to make sure that we have that thick, durable crust on a hardscape job, not that thin one that AJ easily snapped. Right? Yep. Yep. And it's uh, it, it'll be the first thing that you'll get the call back on if something it causes abrasion and that thin crust goes and what's left is loose sand and that's tracked into the pool or whatever. The, the homeowner is going to reach out to the contractor because they're going to have a problem with that because it's not meeting their expectation early into the job. You know? So you got some guidance for us on properly watering G2 polymeric sands. How do we, well, how do we water G2 with rapid set if it self protects from uh, you know, rainfall that quickly? A couple tips. Uh, the, the one key tip is if you want to start at the lower area. And this, Mike, you taught me this. Uh, if you're at a driveway, and it's a considerable slope, or even if there's any slope, you want to start at the lowest area, pound that with water. We say 30 for 30, 30 square feet for 30 seconds. And when I do that in real time, the contractor that I'm doing it with always looks at me like I'm a, a madman. Yeah, you know? they say, wow, that's too much water. What are you doing? You're yeah. going to ruin the polymeric sand. You're not. The, what we're doing is because we set the joint already and we compact it already, and we have that channel and it's below the surface of the chamfer, I'm pounding it with water. All I'm doing is really increasing the, uh, the thickness of that crust that we talked about. Right, so we're gonna show you a quick little video here. It shows watering and getting a very thin crust and watering and getting a very thick crust. So here, you know, misting, light, lightly watering that down. Yep. Uh, we're starting to get the polymeric sand activated, right? Right, at, at the top. But it's only that layer that's wet down that's being activated. And that's what? Eighth of, Eighth an, of inch, an inch, uh, three sixteenths yep. of an inch crust. Yep that'll peel away like paper, right? That's very easy to damage. That's very easy to have it get pushed up above the surface of the paver with subsequent heavier rains or something like that. So not long-term durability like we want. It's not gonna last. It's just simply not gonna last. And what you're gonna be left with is that material underneath that's loose material. So, so let's take a look at proper watering, right? Let's get enough water into that joint. We're gonna water this down and really soak it well and make sure that we get as close to that entire joint saturated as possible, right? Get, you know, an inch, inch and a half down, 
really get that polymeric sand activated so it can form a nice solid crust. And for such a small area, you really dump a considerable amount to achieve that crust. But um, what it, it, to me, it's, it's going to take a little bit more time because you're applying more water, not a considerable amount of more time, but it's going to take a little bit more time, but you're really, really achieving a, like what you saw with my, uh, my karate kick there, you're achieving a much better performing product with that thick crust. So are there any visual signs? Like once water starts to, you know, not soak in, that's enough, right? That would be a, a telltale sign. And then really, I stick to that 30 for 30 pretty stringently. I, I'm on that 30 for 30 because I don't want to come up short of that because I don't know. I, I mean, short of flooding the poly sand out because you're not paying any attention to what you're doing and you keep pounding it with water, you're not going to give it too much water. Am I right on that, Mike? I'd say that you're right in most cases. Okay. Say, oh, hey, if you had a stone dust job, a concrete overlay that's not draining well, you know, you got to be a little bit more careful. But on a traditional drainage base, you can't give it too much water. Right. And those in those instances, whether it's stone dust or concrete overlay, the job will tell you you're putting too much water because it's going to quit taking it. Exactly. You know? Once so. that joint stops absorbing, that's your sign to kind of back off there. Now, yep. 30 for 30, you say you stick to that pretty strictly, but that kind of fits your paver that, hey, you're getting 60, 70 square feet out of a bag of polymeric sand. If you're installing something with a very wide joint and you only get, say, 15 or 20 square feet out of a bag, does that change your mind on the 30 for 30, AJ? Uh, very considerably. So uh, on some of those pavers where you have the, the more considerable joint, you're pounding that with water. Right. I mean, it might be 30 square feet for 60 seconds, You right? could be there for a while. You could be there for a while. But it's also, it's a very visual process. And you can see that what that water is doing, and you should have an understanding of how much water you should... You, how that's percolating down through the joint and, and how far down that's going to some degree. Yeah, don't be afraid to dig into it with a screwdriver or a putty knife just to check how deep that water is getting and adjust your watering procedure accordingly. Yep. Now, also might need to add a little more water if it's really hot, right? Yep. Sometimes the water's evaporating as quickly as you're putting it down. So keep in mind your hot summer temperatures or even your cooler temperatures. Maybe it needs a little less water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something to consider for sure. All right. So those are all very important things to consider with watering. Other thing that we should probably mention is, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm watering polymeric sand, I see a white foam develop, AJ. You know, yep. Is that the polymers coming out that's going to stay in the surface of the pavers? It's not. It's not. The key word, Mike, is surfactant. Am I right? Yeah, you're How right. You like that? How you like that? Today's vocab word, surfactant. So what you're doing is when you see that white uh, foam, essentially, that doesn't mean that you're washing the polymers out. That's a sign that you're pounding it with water. Right, so that is actually a chemical that's in the sand mix that's designed to wick that water down deeper into the joint. Side effect is a little bit of foaming, like soap. But it's in there for a reason. That kind of foam that develops on the surface isn't a cause for alarm. It's going to dissipate on its own and won't leave any kind of haze or residue. That was going to be my next question, because a lot of guys have been burned by previous generation products with a poly haze, and they misinterpret that white foam as, this is going to haze my project. It's not. Right. I mean, all uh, products from Alliance are advanced haze-free technology in the Super Sand and Max, and our G2 technology in the Super Sand and Max versions are so clean these days. You know, right. It's uh, clear polymer technology, you know, almost dust-free with the G2 products. Uh, I'd say that even if I wanted to go out and cause a haze, I wouldn't be able to, AJ. It would be difficult. I really wouldn't know where to start. I'm not really trying to cause any haze, but... Uh, <laughs> That's a good policy. Yeah, yeah, as a general rule. But realistically, Mike's right, is uh, at this point, and that I've been here for a long time, uh, polyhaze used to be a thing that was uh, an industry term and that was seen. At this point, I still feel like sometimes it gets thrown out there, but it's, it's not really the case. Right. So those are really the most common issues we see. And interestingly enough, they correspond to pretty much our three or four installation steps, right? Right, right. <laughs> Make sure you follow the instructions there. And if you're renovating a job, if you're cleaning out polymeric sand joints and replacing them in an existing job, you still need to follow all the instructions for a new install, don't you, AJ? It's almost, I can't, you can't say that it's more important, but it's almost like uh, you have a system or a, a paver patio or a driveway or walkway, and maybe it's 15 or 20 years old. Um, you're assuming responsibility for this as the contractor. So you're going to pressure wash the, the poly sand, the existing poly sand. And how that, deep do you need to go? Well, that's, I like to tell guys, get it all out because you're not going to get it all out. I've tried. You're not going to get it all out. Get as much out as you can. You want that same inch to inch and a half crust we we're talking about early on on a new install. You have to get at least an inch to an inch and a half out to stack the odds in your favor, right, Mike? Right. You need to get as much of that joint material out as you can without undermining the bedding material. So 
an inch and a half is really the minimum. You need to get that inch and a half of joint cleaned out and well, the other thing to consider is you don't know what's underneath those pavers, right? Well, you kind of do because if it's 20 years old and they're covered in moss and mold and mildew, I'll tell you what's not under those pavers is a free draining system, you know what I mean? So, right, so it could be stone dust, could be a concrete overlay, but hey, it's probably a wet environment. So what polymeric sand are we going to pick, that AJ? That orange bag, that beautiful orange bag that we showed up at the beginning, that G2 Gator Max is going to be your best solution for a paver redo because you're already right off the bat, the fact that you're redoing the poly sand, you're asking for more performance from that poly sand. And like we talked about, that's our commercial grade, that's our strong, strongest polymeric sand. All right, excellent. So I'll get my G2, yep. I'll get my Gator Max, yep. and I will go sweep that in the joints. And lucky for me, this is an old job. It's been in the ground for 20 years. I don't need to compact it, it's already settled. Think of the time you'll save, Mike, by leaving that 30 to 50% airspace still in there because we're not compacting at this point to, cons to knock those pavers down, we're compacting, like we talked about earlier, to consolidate that sand. Right. And that vibration is still key. It, again, in a redo, I would argue it's almost more key because you really have to get it down in there if we're going to have this expectation of the poly sand to work on a project that's probably not draining. You yeah. always have to compact your sand, whether it's a new job, whether it's an old job. Right. What if the objection is, uh, hey, this is natural stone. Uh, I can't put my compactor on it or I'll break them. I got a guy that will uh, sell you a roller tamper. Right, so roller compactors, a newer piece of technology, vibrating urethane rollers, less aggressive, but still consolidates the sand very well. You don't have a roller compactor. Any kind of compaction and consolidation is better than nothing. So rubber mallet, two by four, yeah, hand got tamper. A, got a guy that'll sell you a rubber mallet, yeah. You need to make sure that you get some kind of consolidation. So mechanical compaction with a machine is certainly best, but some kind of hand compaction is certainly better than nothing. And I'll be honest with you, the first time I hand tamped with a rubber mallet a natural stone job, I was thinking, well, how much of this are we going to do, you know, the square foot? But it's very impactful when you start hitting that stone, you still see, like you did on that, uh, the vibrating table demo, you still see that sand get consolidated down. And so it, it should speak to you on how important it is to compact, even on a big natural stone joint. All right. Now, say I've got uh, an existing job and, well, I only clean out, say, a quarter inch mm. of the top and add some polymeric sand over top mm. of it. How long do you think that's going to last? Uh, a quarter of a season, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, it's not going to last. It's not, you're, you're asking the poly sand to perform in the outdoor, you know, weather, climate change, and all that stuff, and you put a quarter of an inch down, it's not even engineered to work that way. It's no, not, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's not going to work well. It might not even set up to begin with. It might, it might, yeah, exactly. In short order. So exactly. you can't add a thin layer of polymeric sand over existing polymeric sand, over dirt, over debris in that joint. Just not going to work. And on that same point, it'll be fairly easy for me to diagnose that when you call me out to tell me we have a sand issue. Because if I peel that up and I see the dirt or the existing moss and mold coverage, it, it's very easy to get to the bottom of what happened there. And I'll just tell you what, what has to be done, which is ultimately would have saved you time if you just did it right the first time. Yep. You know? All right, so we've got a couple of uh, you know, job site photos here. Let's take a look uh -oh. at them and see if uh -oh. we can diagnose what's going on. Sheesh, Mike. Yep, that doesn't look good. That's definitely a thin crust, AJ. That's a very thin crust. That looks like a Band-Aid coming off. Right, so that polymeric sand's way too high in the joint. Yep. It looks like it's all actually ramping up from one it's, lower stone to a higher stone. Yep, it's higher than the, than the stone in some places. Yep. So that's no good. Probably couldn't water it properly, right? It's not going to. Yeah, even if you tried, you're not going to water it properly. Right, that water's just going to run off the surface. So couldn't water it properly, you end up with a thin crust. That thin crust, which is set way too high, well, hey, it's prone to, to damage, right? As soon as that polymeric sand gets wet and starts to push up, maybe it lifted above the surface and tore away from the sides. So not a good situation. And that's just going to continue to d deteriorate. That's not going to get any better. That's going to get worse. You yep. Know? What else do we have here? Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Don't like so that one either. A couple Mike. things wrong there. One, sand is definitely too high, but I think the bigger problem is that your polymeric sand's cracking right down the middle, AJ. Yeah, yeah. What do you have to say about that? I would, uh, I would pull that contractor aside, to be honest with you. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but you've got bigger problems than polymeric sand on that project. Right. Polymeric sand is designed to have some flexibility, but if it's tearing right down the center, that means there's quite a bit of movement. I was on that job, and standing on those blue stone, you could physically rock them back and forth under your feet. So well, why didn't your poly sand stop it, Mike? Why didn't your super poly Polymeric yeah. sand's not meant to be glue that holds a project together, right? right? We need the pavers or stone or tile or whatever that hardscape material is to be stable before we install that polymeric sand. Polymeric sand is designed to be a cohesive joint material, 
prevents weeds, burrowing insects, and erosion. But we've got to have stable pavers or stone. We have to have good edge restraint to prevent lateral movement. Polymeric sand's meant to fill that joint, not glue everything together. Makes sense. We have XP glue if you need to glue all your stuff sure, together. Sure, yeah, right? we'll sell you that. What else you got? You got any more pictures, Mike? I mean, oh no. Yep, we do. We do. We got a terrible one here. So I bet that contractor swept that sand across the surface there and didn't compact, right? Filled up the chamfer and nothing else. You can see there's a very small, there's certain spots. Each one of these little problem areas on this project is like its own thing, but there, it's very obvious that there are spots where that sand was left too high in the chamfer and there's no there's no sand underneath it right as that sand is popping out of the chamfer there's nothing left underneath it because it was never compacted and consolidated so not a good situation and i would guess if that job called for nine bags how many bags do you think that guy used probably uh, not nine yeah probably three yeah so he saved a couple bucks there yeah yeah all right what else do we have one last photo i think oh yeah that's an awful awful case with polymeric sand there so Wet set natural stone, right? Yep. Doesn't, not going to work. Doesn't get polymeric sand in the joints. Not going to work. And honestly, if you're dealing with something like maybe this was wet set uh, and they wanted something in there and you were trying to come up with a creative solution for them or whatever, but if you call me on that and there's nothing I would rather do than sell you poly sand, I'm not selling you poly sand. I don't want that job. I don't want that. There's no, it's not going to be able to drain. That poly sand is going to stay wet. Poly sand, as Mike said earlier, derives its strength from the ability to dry out. So it gets wet, we assume it'll get wet again, it's gonna rain, it could encounter water, but it has to be able to dry out. That poly sand may never dry out. No, you got no drainage underneath, you put your sand in a very thin layer, it's installed too high, couldn't compact, right? No. All wet set, no. so Waste never going money. to work. Waste of time and money. Should've just brought that mortar all the way up to the surface. Might as well, might as well, that might be your best call. All right, so real quick, we're going to kind of recap our presentation by playing our installation video for the G2 polymeric sands. You know, while that video is playing, think about any questions you might want to ask and we'll kind of take those after the video. All right. Mike, that music always gets me pumped up to go sweep some polymer sand. Great. Yeah. You can head out and sweep some this afternoon, right. AJ. Sounds good. All right. We have any questions, Eric? Yeah, we had a couple, uh, couple questions come through. So uh, two questions on uh, sweeping polymeric sand. The first one, uh, is there a correct way to sweep? And is it true that the farther away you sweep, you'll be getting less polymers? And then does a surface need to be completely swept off before consolidation? All right, loaded question there. Hopefully we can remember it all and answer it in turn. So, There's a lot there, yeah. Is there a proper way to sweep polymeric sand? Oh, I suppose, right? Sure, yeah. You want to spread that sand out over the surface, right? Getting into the joints as efficiently as possible. Now, say you're working on a, a thousand square foot project. Would you spread that sand out over the whole project? Thousand, all thousand square feet? No, no. Right, we're work... gonna work in sections, right? Right, right. Maybe you do two or 300 square feet and spread that sand out compact it, you know, maybe you have to compact it again, sweep a little more sand in, sweep the excess sand off towards the area that you haven't sanded yet, and then add a little bit more sand to it, right? Yep. So does polymer just you know, disappear from the sand? No, but if you were to push it 
100 feet, you know, 300 feet, well, sure, the, the gradation is changing a little bit, the polymers are falling into the joints and maybe separating from the larger particles, so you always want to kind of leapfrog your way through a project, add more polymeric sand, plus means you're not going to be left with eight bags to clean up at the end of the job, right? Right, which I've seen too. So I think leapfrog is a, a great way to describe it because you are, you're working meticulously. This is a, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, you're putting the finishing touch on a very hard install, a, a paver. Uh, a lot goes into that, that patio or walkway or driveway, and you're putting the finishing touch on it. So let's do it meticulously, and leapfrog really describes wh what I would like to do too. You know, right. Work an area and then continue working towards your goal. And I don't clean the surface off before consolidating. I leave a fair amount of sand on the surface, and that's for a couple reasons. You know, One, that extra sand on the surface kind of protects the surface um, from the, the compactor itself. Plus, as we compact and consolidate those joints, what happens, AJ? It's going to be... Uh, sand drops. You're going to need more sand, right? <laughs> and I, Mike said he doesn't uh, clean it off before he compacts, and I don't do anything that Mike doesn't do when it comes to polymer sand, so that's a good, good tip. Right. You're not going to hurt anything by cleaning it all off, but yeah. hey, you need that sand to sweep back and forth and fill those joints in as they drop, so you might as well leave it on the surface and save yourself a little bit of extra work. Perfect. Good answer. What else, Eric? Uh, is there a way to repair the sand when a thin layer is formed? Unfortunately, there really isn't. If you have a thin crust and it peels off, you're going to be cleaning that joint out and starting over. That initial activation of polymeric sand is incredibly important to the long-term performance. If you don't activate a sufficient depth that first go around, I'd say there's a, a very, very likely chance that it's never going to form that proper, thick, durable crust. So you got one shot. You don't believe in second chances, Mike? Not with polymeric sand. That's fair. That's fair. But that's been my experience, too. If you have that thin crust, there's nothing that's going to bring that back. You're not going to say, well, I'm going to come back in a week. I'm going to pound it with water. You missed your shot. You missed the boat. All right, Eric. What else? Uh, and then lastly, we had, if cleaning out existing sand with a power washer, what is generally the minimum amount of time to wait before returning to install new poly? Oh, it goes back to how long does it take polymeric sand to dry, AJ? Yeah. Well, yeah, you yeah. don't know. You have to wait until it dries. So if that is the north side of a house on stone dust or screenings, it could take a week to dry out. Right, right. And uh, a very bad telltale sign would be if it's dry to the touch, right? The surface is dry. I think it's dry. I power washed an, a day ago, but it feels dry. Everything looks dry. You sweep that poly sand in. You run the compactor because Mike told you to, and you see the water pushing up out of it. Stop right there. Blow it back out. We got to start over. You know, so it has to be dry, not just the surface of the paver, so that you can push the sand across it without causing any issues, but also that bedding layer has to be dry. Right. Very important. You know, hey, pull a paver out and check. Uh, you know, if you're unsure, but make sure that that is dry. I've seen that happen quite a few times where you sweep the sand in and compact and water starts shooting up from un underneath those pavers. So. Well, if we're being honest, Mike, I've done it. I did it. And nothing looks more ridiculous than when I come out and I do it, you know? So I, that was part of my experience, learning from my own poly sand mistakes. So learn from me, do as I say, not as I do, and uh, make sure everything's dry. Well, you won't do it again, will you? No, not a chance. Not and a chance. hopefully no one who's watching today will uh, there you go. have that there occurrence you go. there. So. Hey, we appreciate you tuning in. You know, it was uh, a great time sharing some of our knowledge on polymeric sand and some of the common issues and pitfalls. And if you enjoyed our training today, you can sign up for our text alerts. You know, that'll uh, yeah, let you know about any upcoming training opportunities. And we also will post this and other classes at our education portal, alliancegator.com education. So great to... Uh, Maybe show your crews, show people that missed out on viewing this live, uh, you know, make sure that everybody's got the right information to have success with polymeric sand. Awesome. Well, awesome. I learned a lot here today, Mike. I hope we all hope you guys did, too. And uh, thanks for joining us. All right. Have a great day, everybody.